Order, order. We now come private business. Motion of, on the Committee of Selection. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order of paper, as many of the opinions say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to questions of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. We start with Mr John Barron. Number one, Mr Speaker. Chancellor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he will know that the growth plan. My honourable friend will know the growth plan really uh, was a very, very strong package for business, for small, uh, medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises, and I'm sure that many of his constituents will appreciate the strong measures that we introduced. Excellent. I, I was being slightly. Di- Mr Speaker, I refer members to my entries in the, in the Register of Interest. In welcoming the Government's growth agenda, notwithstanding the lack of reassurance to the market, will the Chancellor seriously considering, consider lowering taxation on smaller businesses, despite the package that has already been announced, because they are the engine room of the economy, they do employ most people in the private sector, and if cost savings are necessary, HS2 and the streamlining of a myriad of crangos could be the first option. Well, of course, uh, I'm very pleased to tell my honourable friend that we're going to introduce the medium-term fiscal plan in three weeks. But consider the, mes- the, the measures we've already introduced. National uh, insurance hikes have been reversed. Corporation tax rise has been scrapped, and the annual investment allowance remains at a million pounds. These are investment. These are measures which uh, small businesses up and down the land have been very, very appreciative of. In Levy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my right honourable friend will be aware, small businesses are the backbone of our local economy, and none no more than Caitlin Bakery in Cramlington, and they have expanded from running a bakery to running a cafe and now a dessert bar. So would my right honourable friend please assure me that he will, this government will do all we can to help these businesses thrive? Absolutely right. And of course, in relation to the bakery that he uh, mentions, uh, Catling bake, Bakery, we've also supported them through an energy package. Yeah. Uh, £60 billion for households and businesses for six months. And that's something that we absolutely uh, felt necessary to do. Go McCartney. Thank you, Speaker. It's like I never went away, and I refer members and colleagues to my entry in the Register of Interest. Supporting businesses will always be a key pillar for growing our economy, and by association, our small and medium-sized businesses, which there are many of in Lincoln and more across our county of Lincolnshire. They should be at the forefront of the Government's growth agenda. Devolved areas such as Teesside and the West Midlands have continually been successful in delivering for their areas. Greater Lincolnshire stands ready right now for a maximum devolution deal. Therefore, will the Treasury support any such deal for Greater Lincolnshire? My yeah. honourable well, friend uh, knows, Mr Speaker, that devolution is at the heart of the Government's plans to level up and strengthen communities. And of course, in the levelling up white paper, the Government has fully committed to offering a devolution deal to every area that wants one by 2030. Yeah. Sherman. Oh, you won't be around Mr. Then, Mr. Speaker, can I declare an interest to the uh, Chancellor? I've actually worked in a small and medium business. I've actually, unlike many people on these benches, worked in manufacturing industry. And the manufacturing SMEs in my constituency are absolutely up against it in terms of the cost of energy. What is he going to do to relieve them right now? I think the Honourable Gentleman makes a very good uh, point and represents his constituency ably. In respect of small businesses, we have introduced a package, an energy price guarantee, not only for households but for businesses, uh, which is to the tune of £30 billion uh, in the first uh, six months. This was something that was absolutely necessary, and I am very proud of the fact that we acted very swiftly to protect uh, businesses like those in his constituency. Sarah Owen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Government's failed mini-budget has sent interest rates soaring, which is already causing mortgage pain for millions. But rising borrowing costs are now threatening our high streets too. (coughs) Small businesses in Richmond Park and across the UK are seeing their loan repayments spiral and their financing options dry up. We have already seen the highest company insolvency since the financial crisis. More than 5,600 businesses have closed in the second quarter of this year, and SME debt is now at a staggering £204 Most of these businesses won't see a penny from the cut to corporation tax. What is the Chancellor? Order, 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 order. Chancellor, come on. Thank we you. Can't As I've stated that. a number of times already, 
the energy package, the energy support package, will help every single one of the businesses in her constituency. And I'd be very uh, pleased to see the Lib Dem growth plan, the anti-growth yeah. coalition, yeah. Car- carbs yeah. from the sidelines, but it has nothing to say yeah. about growth. Yeah. Chris Bryan. The one thing that businesses always want is security and understanding of what's going to happen for them next year. They're worrying about mortgage, uh, their borrowing costs for next year. The Chancellor has already made that more difficult for them. He says that he's got a package for um, energy costs, for, but it only lasts for six months. Um, a leisure company I spoke to, the man who owns a leisure company that I was speaking to you yesterday said that his bill next year will be going from £100,000 to £475,000. He will be closing. Why doesn't he bring in a proper measure that's going to last more than six months? So, I think the Honourable Gentleman makes a fair point in respect to energy costs. And that is precisely why we intervened in the way that that my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, announced only a couple of weeks ago. The package is £60 billion for households and businesses uh, across the next six months. And that is a generous package, and we are listening. SMP spokesperson Alison Foulis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Businesses of all sizes are struggling with Brexit, import costs, material costs, the weak pound against the dollar and the euro, increased wage and energy costs. And they still don't know what will happen when the Chancellor's temporary reprieve ends in March. The clock <coughs> is ticking. Calder Millerfield, a food manufacturing business in my constituency, have come back to me with their latest quote with the relief applied. £944,000 per year, up from £160,000 last year. What was the Chancellor going to do to support manufacturing businesses now, because they will not survive with these increases? Chancellor. As I've stated, the energy price guarantee does help uh, in in, in a large measure businesses. And also, I'm not, Mr Speaker, going to take lectures from the SNP about growth. I mean, in Scotland, for every year from 2010 to 2019, the growth was lower than for the rest of the United Kingdom. I'm not going to take any uh, uh, lessons about supporting business from the Honourable Lady. Boris Robertson. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor speaks regularly to the Governor of the Bank of England on a wide range of matters. As my Honourable Friend knows, the Bank of England sets monetary policy, including interest rates, independently of government. Boris Robertson. I thank the Minister for that response. Obviously, the world situation is the biggest cause of the rise in interest rates, but that is having a detrimental effect on mortgage payers, of course, and it risks negativising the very welcome help that the government has provided through energy costs and tax cuts. Can the Chancellor and the Ministers meet more regularly with the Bank of England to coordinate policy a little more closely? Minister. I thank my honourable friend for his question. He's a passionate advocate in this place for his constituents. Uh, the Chancellor and myself meet regularly uh, with the Bank of England and with all of the individual uh, lending banks in the UK. My honourable friend knows that interest rates have increased in every major economy, uh, despite what the opposition may claim to say, and that's why it's so important that we're providing help with energy and cutting taxes. Yeah. Same Angela Riedel. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, but surely uh, ministers must now, first of all, apologise for yeah. the chaos. Yeah. 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 Mini budget with its 45 billion of unfunded spending commitments yeah. in tax exactly. cuts yeah. has caused to the bond markets. And isn't it now a fact that there is a Tory premium on every interest yes. rate rise for every borrower in this country, and they're not going to forget it when the election comes? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I think we understand there's a very clear divide in this House between our side, which is supporting growth, which is providing, su- which is providing support for energy bills, giving the economy the confidence and certainty that it needs this winter, and bringing forward supply-side measures that's going to boost the economy, not, help, not be on the side of striking workers, bringing this economy to a halt. Sh- Shadow Minister Pat McFadden. Thank you. Uh, With your permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to send my condolences to the families of all those killed in the tragic accident in Chrysler, County Donegal, last week. My parents came from quite nearby. It is a beautiful place with a close community, and they are very much in our prayers right now. I would also like to welcome the Minister to his position. I am sure that he and the Chancellor's team wanted their first budget to be remembered, perhaps even studied in years to come. Well, Mr Speaker, they have certainly 
achieved that ambition. <laughs> Two-year fixed mortgage rates are above 6% for the first time since 2008, and they've risen sharply since the Chancellor's mini-budget. Everyone coming off such a rate will face much higher payments over the coming year, possibly hundreds of pounds a month more. Why should people who have worked hard to buy their own home pay the price for the government's mistakes? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to add my comments and thoughts to uh, the uh, incident in County Down last week. Um, we talked, Mr Speaker, already about our comprehensive energy support package uh, that, that helps not just every household this winter, preventing them from the uncertainty of an energy bills that were potentially forecast to reach £6,500 per home, uh, but also businesses. Uh, and this is the government that is on the su support side of businesses that is keen to improve the supply side of our economy so that we can grow to create the tax revenues for our high-quality public services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning, the Bank of England made a further intervention in the markets, warning of, and I quote, a material risk to UK financial stability. This risk comes directly from the Chancellor's mini-budget two and a half weeks ago. How much more will government borrowing costs next year as a result of the rise in guilt yields since the Chancellor's statement on September 23rd? Mr Speaker, as I have already observed, um, we are seeing interest rates rise in every major Western economy. Perhaps the opposition front benches, when they are finished with their British exceptionalism, will actually lift their eyes uh, and notice that. What is more important is that we are protecting consumers and households through the difficult winter months ahead. We are cutting taxes, measures that this side of the House supports and that side of the House opposes. SNP spokesperson Alison Poulos. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The IMF observed today that the Chancellor's unfunded tax cuts have complicated the fight against inflation. As a result, the Bank of England is expected to increase the base rate to levels not seen since 2008. Families have already struggled with increasing energy prices, and Kantar say that grocery inflation stands at 13.9%. Santander are preparing for increased mortgage defaults. So, can I ask the Minister what are he and his Treasury team doing to tackle the chaos, this absolute chaos they have created themselves? Minister. Mr Speaker, I understand that it is absolutely inimical to the uh, Nationalist Party to talk this country down at every opportunity. Yeah, the, re the, reality, yeah, 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 yeah. the reality is that we are taking the action that we need, we are tackling supply side. We are tackling the strikes that are grinding down the economy, and we are building the energy that we need that will help strengthen our economy and strengthen our currency. Her party oppose nuclear, and they oppose more oil and gas exploration. Sir. Four. Minister. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with permission, I'd like to group this with question number eleven. A critical part of the government's growth plan is uh, road, rail and energy infrastructure, and we will be introducing legislation very shortly to make sure the delivery of that critical infrastructure is massively sped up. Thank you. I am grateful for the investment in physical infrastructure, but the, uh, the Treasury front branch will know that infrastructure needs skills. We need the skills uh, for the future to deliver the jobs for the future to make the infrastructure investment sustainable. So will the minister meet with me to discuss the idea for MKU, a brand new university in Milton Keynes? Every single minister and secretary of state that I've spoken to about this thinks it's a good idea. Will he meet with me and get it off paper and get boots on the ground? Minister. Well, I thank my uh, honourable friend, the member for Milton Keynes North, who is a tireless champion for the great uh, place or the great town of Milton Keynes. I would be, I would be delighted uh, to meet with him to discuss this idea, along with colleagues, perhaps from the Department for Education. Uh, I note, of course, that Milton Keynes uh, has already received £23 million pounds through the Towns Fund, um, but I am very happy uh, to meet with him to discuss this idea. John Stevenson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Uh, growing the economy is about improving people's lives, but also improving the success of places like Carlisle. Yeah. To achieve this, we need investment, both public and private, 
and in the case of public investment, it is an inf infrastructure that will make the real yeah, difference. Yeah. Given the rise in the cost of such infrastructure projects, can the Chancellor or the Minister confirm that where these projects have a shortfall in funding and but are ready to go, that the Government will step in and uh, give additional funding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it is very much our intention to speed up projects where they are ready to go. Uh, the uh, growth plan announced a few weeks ago made very clear our commitment to doing that. Uh, the last spending review provided, I think, about £100 billion of funding towards critical economic uh, infrastructure. Uh, but where we can speed projects up, uh, we will certainly be doing that. And I think one of the projects that we have in mind uh, to do exactly that for is the A66 uh, North Trans Pennine route, which I believe goes not far from the Honourable Gentleman's constituency. Nick Smith. Mr Speaker, in 2017, former Conservative Energy Minister Charles Hendry conducted a review into the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. He gave it a thumbs up, but since then successive governments haven't pursued it. Now, given the energy crisis we are in, will the Minister consider reopening the business case? It could be a fantastic source of green energy for our country. Um, well, well, the government is extremely interested in all forms of new energy generation. We're determined to make sure that the United Kingdom is electricity independent. There are all kinds of projects we're looking at, including, of course, marine projects. I understand that when the Swansea scheme was previously investigated, there were questions uh, about value uh, for money. Uh, but I'm sure uh, any proposition that is put forward, and if the Honourable Gentleman wants to do it, uh, we'd be very happy to take a careful look at it. Stephen Flynn. When it comes to the delivery of projects, we can't help but admire the speed at which the government has managed to transform Downing Street from a nightclub into a casino. <laughs> but I have, one, I have one ask that isn't a gamble. The Acorn project in the northeast of Scotland, ah. when are they going to deliver it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my uh, honourable friend, the Chancellor, says that that is something we are examining uh, very carefully. Uh, but let me say, his characterisation of the uh, growth plan, I think, is extremely unfair. The real risk. I would say that the real risk is in not having a growth plan. The real risk is in having taxes that are too high. The real risk is not investing in infrastructure. What is clear is that this government has a growth plan. The opposition has no plan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, it's always right to look for efficiencies and try and get better value money for the taxpayer. As we look for spending cuts, could my Right, my friend, confirm that those spending cuts will not come at the expense of reductions of vital infrastructure spending in our regions, <laughs> not least in the north of England. Minister. Yeah, well, I'm pleased to say, as the Chancellor said when he introduced the growth plan, that expediting critical infrastructure is an important part of that plan. Uh, without critical infrastructure, we're not going to see the growth in jobs, the growth in wages and the prosperity that we all want to see. And this government will do everything it can to speed up the delivery of those projects. Five bets. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We don't yeah. know much yet about the government's new investment zones, yeah. but in order to achieve the success of the private investment in them, will the government have specifically targeted uh, funds for infrastructure projects in those zones? And if so, will this be a further unfunded expenditure commitment? <laughs> Well, the, um, I think the Chancellor set out the investment zone concept uh, very clearly. There would be, by agreement with local authorities, uh, planning freedoms and also very significant uh, tax cuts. Infrastructure investments are being handled separately to that, but I think it would be reasonable to expect a degree of coordination uh, between, the, between DLUC and the Department of Transport as they consider the way that investment zones interact with transport projects. Why well, should it call Number five, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, reforming the EU's directive on bonus cap is not about paying people more. All it ever did was increase base pay regardless of performance. It was never a cap on total remuneration, and no one should pretend that it was. Marshall de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That was total nonsense. But as some families in Battersea struggle to keep up with the rising cost of living, this government has chosen to help bankers by removing the cap on their bonuses whilst maintaining the cap on household social security. Shame. Now, Despite soaring bills and growing inflation, the cap has remained stagnant since 2016, plunging hundreds of thousands of fam families into deep 
poverty. The cap on social security is cruel. And how can the Chancellor seriously justify exactly. removing the cap on bankers' bonuses, but not on the social security cap? So hey, will he have a word with his colleagues at the Work and Pensions Department and change that? Hey. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady has fully booked her place as a member of the anti growth Coalition. Anti-growth. In 1970, yeah. in, this government is not afraid to be on the side of the people that create the wealth that funds our public services. In 1979, the top 1% of earners paid about 10% of income tax. They now pay 29.1%. That's three times as much. A friend agree with me that scrapping the cap on bankers' bonuses will not only increase competitiveness, but also increase tax receipts as well, Mr Speaker? Minister. Yes. Truly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At a time when my constituents are struggling to make ends meet, they're struggling to put food on the table and struggling to put the heating on, this government has decided the way to increase growth in the economy is to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses. As Shadow City Minister, not a single person that I spoke to in the city or a single bank that I spoke to said this was the right policy to drive growth in the economy. So could I ask the Minister, does he really think this policy will drive growth in the economy, or are we going to see yet another U-turn from his government? Minister. I I can assure the uh, Honourable Lady that this government is going to grow the economy, uh, and it's going to grow the economy by releasing by releasing the burden, the yoke of taxation, whether that's on ordinary people cutting the basic rate of tax from 20 pence uh, to 19 pence, whether it's today by reversing uh, the increase in national insurance uh, or by cutting the taxes on the businesses that she's been meeting, and I welcome that, uh, by reversing the increase in corporation tax next year. Mr Magnall. Mr Speaker. This government will back first-time buyers by increasing the level at which they start paying stamp duty. Young couple can now pay, uh, purchase a property for up to four hundred and twenty-five thousand without paying tax. Mr. Speaker, it's a core tenant of our belief to help everyone onto the housing ladder. So, can I ask the minister what assessment has he made since the growth plan about helping people and areas build houses for those who need it and want it? Minister. <laughs> My honourable friend, the uh, Secretary of State for Department of Housing Local Government will be making a statement to this House in the coming weeks. Lawrence Eshelur, mate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent wrote to me and said, what world do the Tories live in? I guess one where you protect the rich and wealthy. The suggestion that the Treasury thinks that a person on 30k a year can buy a home in London is frankly laughable and salt in the wound. Can I please ask the Minister how he expects my constituents in Vauxhall, who are already struggling to pay their rent, to save on a salary of 30k to buy a new home? Minister. I'd be very happy to uh, to write to the Honourable Lady to to talk to her constituents about the unprecedented intervention that we have made to protect her constituents this winter from their energy bills, putting valuable certainty and confidence not just into every household but into every business and the economy, which is why today the IMF have increased their growth forecast for the United Kingdom. Number seven, Mr Speaker. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. In relation to his question, he will have seen that I brought forward the publication of the medium-term fiscal plan to the 31st of October. Mr Speaker, I think the House will agree with me that the uncertainty over the state hasn't exactly helped forward planning when it came to benefits. Any real cut in benefits will mean people not having enough money to buy food and buy clothing for their children. So does the Chancellor agree with me that increasing benefits in line with inflation is the only fair way forward. Indeed, it would be immoral to do otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as the Chief Executive of Inverness Citizens Advice Bureau has pointed out to me, such benefit money is spent locally, within yeah. the local economy, yeah, yeah, yeah. and is a boost to what the Chancellor has talked about many times, which is growing the economy. Well, I'm delighted to see that um, our one member of the Anti Growth Coalition is focusing uh, on growth. But in relation to his specific question, he will understand that the medium-term fiscal plan uh, is coming out on the 31st of October, and I'm not going to prejudge uh, any measures in it. Robert Halford. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does my right friend agree that um, a very important part of the plan for growth is the levelling, levelling up fund? And has my right honourable friend seen Harlow Council's levelling up fund bid, which I wholeheartedly support, which would transform a derelict area of our town centre into a thriving cultural quarter with jobs, investment, and tackling antisocial behaviour, and with these abandoned buildings that have far too long blighted the heart of our town? I know that my right honourable friend is a redoubtable and uh, highly persuasive. Uh, representative of his constituents, and I'd be very happy to talk to him about what we can do together uh, to help this, his great constituency. Stephen uh, Mr. Speaker, the Bank of England has had to intervene not once, not twice, but three times now, and the impact on pension funds is obviously very, very significant. Many of my constituents are going to be deeply worried. What assessment has the Chancellor made of the impact on potential additional uh, pressures on the economy in the future on public sector? pension pay because of the damage to pension funds for pensioners yeah, yeah, yeah. up and down this country. Is that another reason why he didn't want to publish the OBR at the time of his mini-budget? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Jump OBR forward. will be uh, fully scoring and giving a forecast ahead of the medium-term fiscal plan. In relation to the Bank of England, uh, I speak to uh, the Governor very frequently, and uh, he is someone who is absolutely independent and is, is actually managing uh, what is a global situation very effectively. Yeah. <laughs> Chair of the Select Committee, Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, I very much welcome my right honourable friend's decision to bring forward the medium-term plan and the OBR forecast. He has listened, and he is right. But could I caution him that when it comes to the measures that he puts forward to underpin that forecast, that he reaches out as much as he can across this side of the house and the other side of the house to be absolutely certain that he can get those measures through this house? Any failure to do so will unsettle the market. Uh, my right honourable friend uh, is absolutely right. He does a brilliant job uh, chairing his committee um, and is full of wise counsel. And he's absolutely right that we will and should uh, canvass opinion uh, widely ahead of the publication of the plan. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the OBR was the creation of a Conservative government designed to curtail. Uh, wishful thinking in economic <laughs> policy. So, does the Chancellor agree with me that it's unfortunate, to say the least, that we seem to have cabinet ministers briefing against the economic expertise of that independent institution? Chancellor, yeah. yeah. as far as I'm concerned, and I speak to investors regularly about this, the OBR, the OBR, the OBR, the OBR. The OBR is a, an institution that commands wide respect, not only in the UK but across the world, and its independence to me is absolutely sacrosanct. Yeah, you're right, you're okay. Gail The energy price guarantee is an outstanding part of the growth plan and key, but far too few businesses and households know about it. Can I urge the Chancellor to? have a nationwide mail-out campaign coupled to government taking the lead on the reduction of energy in all public buildings as the Germans and other countries are doing so. This has the twin benefit of saving consumers and also reducing taxpayer subsidies. I think my honourable friend makes an excellent suggestion. Obviously, I am very careful not to make unfunded uh, uh, spending commitments um, on the floor of the House, uh, but his suggestion is a very well-made one which we should look into. Shadow Minister James Murray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Chancellor's refusal to publish OBR forecasts just over two weeks ago played a key role in falling confidence in the pound, rising borrowing costs and market panic. His woeful decision to avoid scrutiny by gagging the OBR helped increase mortgage costs for working people who are now paying the price for Conservative failure. The Chancellor's behaviour has been described by the former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney as undercutting economic institutions, and Jonathan Haskell, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, made clear that a sidelined OBR generates more uncertainty. Does the Chancellor accept they are right? As I have repeatedly said in this session, the OBR will have a fully forecasted and scored uh, response to the medium-term fiscal plan in less than three weeks. George Freeman. Question eight, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the, yeah, 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 yeah. 
At the, thank you. At the 2021 spending review, the government announced an increase in public expenditure on R&D to £20 billion per year by 2024-25, including funding for association to EU programmes. George Freeman. The Chancellor and his team for making the Treasury a growth department. And would they agree with me that innovation-led growth is particularly important if we want to drive up productivity, competitiveness and inward investment, that our high growth sectors like space, agri-tech and fusion have a big role to play? And would the Minister specifically reassure those in the R&D community that he won't be tempted to reduce the allocation for Horizon or for science and research in the CSR in order to reassure the markets? Mr Speaker, very few members of this House can look back on a track record of commitment to research and development as significant as my honourable friend, both as a minister and as backbencher, and so I am happy to confirm to him that we will abide by the Spending Review 2021 decision. That includes funding for core Innovate UK programmes, for Association of Horizon Europe and for ARIA. But, Mr. but the Minister needs to be much more specific about the Horizon Europe programme. Is he aware of what the Nobel laureate Sir André Guillaume said, that top academics are leaving the country in yeah. despair because the government are negotiating on Horizon Europe? When will the government do something now? Yeah. Minister. Well, the, the Honourable Lady is right at the importance of this issue, and the United Kingdom absolutely wishes to move forward, and we would hope the EU would move forward at pace with us to reach an agreement. Mike Kingsbury. Question number nine, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the loan charge was announced at Budget 2016 as part of a package of measures to tackle disguised remuneration tax avoidance. At Spring Statement 2022, this package was estimated to bring in an, est- uh, an overall exchequer yield of £3.4 billion. The changes resulting from the 2019 independent review of the loan charge have reduced the exchequer yield by an estimated £620 million. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Too many everyday people are facing huge bills, untold distress, and in some cases personal harm and indeed suicide because of a loan charge scandal. Can the Minister now commit, can the Government commit to finally commission? A truly independent review to deal with this mess. Minister. Well, I think all members of this House who have met constituents who have been affected by the loan charge cannot fail to have been moved by the emotional and psychological impact that has had on many of them. Uh, and as Minister, it is right, therefore, that I should look at this issue carefully, and I can say to the member that I will engage with all interested parties on this matter. Dan Jarvis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number 12. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to answer my first question at the dispatch box from the member from Barnsley Central who replied to my maiden speech. Uh, With permission, Mr. Speaker, I should like to answer this question alongside number 17. The Leveling Up White Paper set out a clear plan to level up every corner of the UK by 2030. We are also driving growth and unlocking housing across the UK with our new investment zones. And we are continuing to invest billions in regional infrastructure, including £1.7 billion allocated under the Leveling Up Fund, of which £500 million went to the north. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It is a pleasure to see the Minister at the dispatch box, and I congratulate her on her appointment. Previous Chancellors have not delivered the level of transformative resource required to level up. Now, I know that the Chancellor does understand the huge potential that exists right across the north of England, but for many of us, the levelling up agenda is sipping in the last chance saloon. So, can the Minister say what is going to be done differently under this new Chancellor? We are absolutely committed to the levelling up agenda. And if we look at South Yorkshire, South Yorkshire received £570 million through the Regional Cities Transport Scheme, £95 million through the Levelling Up Fund, and £46 million through the Shared Prosperity Fund. Our ambitions with levelling up continue. Yeah. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. 
Minister, building on the back of Bradford City of Culture win and in this momentous year for Rugby League, I am supporting the plan for the transformation and regeneration of the home of the Bradford Bulls, the iconic Odsall Stadium, to become a world-class sports, music and culture arena. This plan would be an incubator for the ambitions of the entire Bradford district, delivering over a billion pounds worth of socio-economic benefits. However, following the Bank of England's repeated interventions, can the Minister confirm the levelling up fund round two will still be going ahead in full and will the Minister and the Chancellor demonstrate this by meeting with me, Bradford Council and the Bradford Bulls and the RFL to discuss our catalyst for growth? Well, I can absolutely confirm that we will be going ahead with the second round of the levelling up fund, and there should be decisions by the end of the year. Uh, I wish her well in her bid. Uh, clearly, there is an independent assessment going on of the bids at the moment, but if it is possible to meet, then we will do that. But clearly, we need to decide if that is appropriate. And I would also like to congratulate her on her success in the first round of the levelling up bid where she got 20 million for our Squire Lane Leisure Centre. Yeah, yeah. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The renewable energy sector is uh, vital to my uh, Cleethorpes constituency in the neighbouring area and has done a great deal to level up the local economy. Can the Minister give an assurance that, that su the support for the sector will continue? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, we are very much so committed to the sector, and I would be delighted to sit down with the honourable gentleman to discuss further. Paul, Mr. Speaker, a key part of levelling up is the creation of investment zones. The Chancellor will be aware of the proposals for a gigafactory at Coventry Airport to support UK automotive manufacturing. Does the uh, Minister agree with me that the joint application by Labour, Coventry City Council, and Conservative Warwickshire County Council? For an investment zone at, uh, at Coventry Airport should be uh, should be encouraged. Minister, we're encouraging all higher local authorities to look at the investment zones and to apply. I think that they are a great tool for development. So absolutely, I would encourage that application. Pete Wishart. Mr Speaker, uh, never so much chaos has ever been inflicted on so many by so few will be the motto that will reverberate down the eons for this government. But can I ask her, do they actually still believe in this fairy tale of levelling up? Isn't it now just a matter of how far they're going to level us all down? Yeah. Minister. Everything that we are doing is being driven by a growth agenda yeah. so that we can level up all the way across the United Kingdom. David Morris. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear at that moment in time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Eden Project North is, as far as I'm aware, the only project in the levelling up round two that has got planning permission and land allocated. Um, what I would like to know is when the decisions will be made so that we can get um, this shovel ready scheme going, because Eden themselves have got £50 million from the table and we're asking for £50 million as match funding in effect. Decisions on the second phase of the levelling up round will be made by the end of the year, and I wish him very well. David Linden, Bartin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have regular discussions with my honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. If his question relates to the operating budget of DWP, uh, we expect departments to live within their existing CSR 21. Uh, allocations. If his question relates to the level of benefits uh, more generally, uh, there is a statutory process which, of course, is undertaken every year. No decisions have yet been made, and they will be made in due course in the normal way. David Linden. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer, if not his recent tweets? Um, can I also ask him as well if he's had any representations <coughs> from the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to increase social security payments? in line with inflation. Far too often this government talks about its agenda for growth, but failure to increase in line with inflation will result just in growth in food banks in Easter House, fuel poverty in Carmyle and child poverty in Bayliston. So when is he going to do the right thing and commit to rising uh, social security in line with inflation, not earnings? Well, I'm obviously not going to offer any kind of running commentary on internal uh, discussions which are going on. I've said that the normal, ordinary statutory process 
is ongoing, but of course the government is mindful of the uh, cost of living pressures that people um, are facing. I would draw, uh, draw the honourable member's attention to the very large increase in the national minimum wage, I think about 7 per cent, that took place last uh, April or May. Uh, and of course, there are also now more vacancies in the economy than there are people on unemployment benefits as well. Julian Smith. Confirm to this House that uh, the Government will not balance the forthcoming tax cuts on the back of the poorest people in our country. Well, I think the, the objective of this Government is first of all to make sure that the economy is growing. That will help lift wages, it will create new jobs, and it will create a sustainable tax base for our public services. Um, but as we make these decisions that my honourable friend refers to, of course we are going to balance uh, considerations of fairness, the cost of living pressures that people suffer, along, of course, uh, with interests of the taxpayers who are working hard to pay tax as well. Chair of the PAC, Dan Magpillia. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Minister has talked about vacancies in the job market. There are vacancies, of course, but many of my constituents, and under 12,000 a year, will benefit from the tax cut, mm. rely on universal credit to make up the gap, can't afford to work because of the cost, high costs of childcare, yep. and they are literally on the poverty line already. What is his advice to them, and will he, will he give us some comfort that the DWP will make, or the government will make the right decision on uprating benefits? Minister. Well, I'm, I've already explained that the normal statutory process is underway, but when it comes to helping people on low incomes, I've mentioned already uh, the very significant increase in the minimum wage uh, just a few months ago. We've made an unprecedented intervention this year, amounting to £37 billion, which is disparate already, which is disproportionately directed towards people on lower incomes. So the one third of households on lower incomes are receiving an extra £1,200 this year. The honourable lady also, the honourable lady also referred to the fact that people earning now £12,570 or less pay no, not a penny of national insurance and not a penny of income tax. And that is thanks to the action of this Conservative government. David Simmons. Number 14, sir. Uh, the gov Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government is encouraging business innovation through many ways. Let me enumerate four for my uh, colleague. A significant uplift in R&D expenditure, as I mentioned to my honourable friend, the member for Mid-Norfolk. Uh, innovation loans of £150 million over the spending period. Research and development tax reliefs. Long-term investment for technology and science, which is a competition providing up to £500 million in government support. And the British Business Bank, which is, in is supporting innovative businesses, including through the Future Fund. David well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, owners and entrepreneurs behind small businesses, like the team behind Code Ninjas in Bridge Street, in my constituency, are a key part of the government's growth agenda. So, may I ask, my old friend, what steps he has in mind that will enable small and medium-sized enterprises like this to further create jobs and growth? Minister, right, I'm not sure I got the name quite correct, Mr. Speaker. Was it Code nin Ninjas? Was it? Code Ninjas. Oh, ninjas. All right. Well. I, well I, <laughs> Maybe I can visit my old friend's constituency to learn about what they do. But what I would say more generally, what I would say more generally, is that Growth Plan did focus on important measures to support uh, small businesses that wish to grow, including making the one million uh, AIA uh, allowance permanent, looking to expand the amount of money that can be given to, to small businesses to grow through the SEIS fund, and of course, most importantly, through the government's energy price support through this winter. We now come to topical Stephanie Peacock. Topical question number one, Mr Speaker. Chancellor. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This government is relentlessly, relentlessly focused, Mr Speaker, on growing the economy. Putin's barbaric war in Ukraine continues to put pressure on gas prices. So it was absolutely right that with predictions of typical bills reaching four to £6,500 a year, uh, Mr Speaker, people needed immediate support to get them through this winter. Yeah, yeah. Last month, we set out the growth plan which will focus on breaking out of the high tax, low growth cycle that we were currently trapped in. This will put more money in people's pockets and raise living standards for all our people. Mr. Speaker, this week I wrote to my right honourable friend, the member for Central Devon, to inform him that I will set out the medium term fiscal plan on the 31st of October to remind the House. Uh, and I wish to remind the House that this will be accompanied by a full economic and fiscal forecast published by the Office for Budget Responsibility. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chancellor sat in a cabinet that committed to increasing social security payments in line with inflation. Why won't he honour that promise? 
We got you. As Chance. I've said repeatedly, and my uh, honourable, right honourable friend has, uh, we will be. Uh, no decisions have been made. There's a, co- uh, a, a natural, usual uh, statutory process that's being undertaken, and we will have uh, more detail at the time of the medium-term fiscal plan. Richard Putcher. Mr. Speaker, the Chancellor will know that Essex is a pro-growth county um, and the heart of economic growth. So, in order to support job creation and more economic growth, will he commit to funding the duelling off the A120 between Braintree and Marks Tay, and importantly, along the route that the County Council, businesses, and the local community have specified? Chancellor, um, I wish to address her and pay tribute to. Uh, her role in cabinet in government. Uh, she is a uh, fantastic colleague, the right honourable gentleman. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, w- I wish to confirm that the A120 Braintree to A12 remains under active uh, consideration alongside the rest of the third road investments back to the pipeline. We come to Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the Chancellor's disastrous mini budget just 18 days ago, we've seen wild swings in the value of the pound. Gilt yields up 100 basis points in a single day, and the Bank of England stepping in because, in their words, of a material risk to UK financial stability. And the IMF has now said that UK growth is to slow further next year. This is a British crisis made in Downing Street. No other government is sabotaging their own country's economic credibility as this government is. So, Mr Speaker, can I ask... Are the Chancellor and the Prime Minister the last people left on earth who actually think that their plan is working? Just to pick up on a point, the IMF said today that actually the the plan, the mini budget, has increased uh, the the forecast for growth. That's exactly, that's exactly, that's precisely the opposite of what the Honourable Lady has said. And it's very clear where we stand on this. We've got pro growth pro-enterprise, pro-business, yeah. uh, conservatives on one side, and the anti-growth coalition yeah. on the other side, yeah. who want to tax more and want to, ha- to commit us to low growth. Rachel Reeves. Insert third Speaker, the Chancellor is in a dangerous state of denial, yeah. but the costs of these mistakes are all too real for everyone else. Yeah. Borrowing costs up growth down, mortgage payments set to increase by £500 a month. Now they scrabble around looking for cuts, hitting the most vulnerable and hitting our public services. It does not need to be this way. So will the Chancellor now put aside his pride, do the right thing for our country, end this trickle-down nonsense and reverse the budget? So which of the tax cuts... Which of the tax cuts are they? Are they, what they do they want to uh, stop uh, the basic uh, rate, the cut in the basic rate? Uh, are they committed to having a, t- a high tax uh, a- a economy? And the other thing I would suggest is that she should get her facts right. The IMF today have said that our growth is going up, not going down. Mr. Speaker. Early results from my local business survey strongly suggest that a lower VAT rate would increase investment, which itself then would boost recovery and growth in the hospitality sector in my beautiful constituency of Eastbourne. Uh, Will my right honourable friend be reviewing the case for a lower rate to bring us back into line with some of our international competitors? Minister. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Eastbourne is indeed beautiful, as indeed is North East Bedfordshire and many other parts of, of, the, <laughs> of the country. And, and my honourable friend is absolutely right to talk about the importance of VAT to the hospitality industry, particularly as we move through the period of COVID recovery. But as we now move towards the growth plan, we need to look at the level of, of taxes on small businesses in general, and that is a key part of the uh, work that I'll be looking at as part of the tax simplification plan. Kirsten Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Push payment fraud losses increased by 71% in the first half of 2021, with the losses from that type of fraud surpassing card fraud for the first time. So what steps is the Chancellor taking to tackle this huge surge in this fraud and, importantly, to ensuring that victims, including my constituents, are reimbursed for their losses instead of being unfairly penalised for falling victim to these increasingly sophisticated scams? Minister. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, push payment fraud is indeed a growing problem. It is one the Government takes very seriously. Uh, it is why we will be taking powers in the Financial Services and Markets Bill that will mandate reimbursement to consumers. Theresa Villiers. It's a, it's a massive relief that the nightmare scenario of energy bills of, of four or five or even six thousand pounds has been prevented by the energy price cap. Yeah, yeah. Will the government explain how they're, they're reducing the cost to taxpayers of that scheme and stabilising the, the energy market for the future? Absolutely Councilor. right. I think my right honourable friend was 100% right to notice that the energy intervention uh, was exactly the right thing. Uh, we're going to have a, a commitment. Uh, to fiscal responsibility, which will stabilise uh, uh, the, the economic uh, situ situation and picture. And I'm sure that her constituents will fully understand what the growth plan is all about. It's about putting more money into their pockets so we can have a growing and dynamic economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. Mr. Speaker, the Scottish Government announced yesterday that they will be doubling the December bridging payment which is granted to low-income families to £260. The Child Poverty Action Group noted that this will make a real difference to households struggling with the cost of living crisis. What plans does the UK Government have to follow suit and bring in targeted measures for low-income households? Yes. So, as my uh, right honourable friend, uh, the Chief Secretary, said earlier, most of the measures that constituted £37 billion intervention were targeted directly at vulnerable uh, constituents, all our uh, vulnerable constituents here uh, in this House. The energy uh, price guarantee also uh, is going to be greatly beneficial uh, to people uh, across uh, our country who are suffering from the cost of living. There is a huge amount of intervention uh, that this Government is, is committed to, and of course our top priority is to make sure that everyone uh, can get through uh, challenging times as best they can. Or a trough. Yeah. The yeah, Chancellor has yeah, provided yeah. Uh, vital support for families across Seven Oaks and Swanley with their energy yeah, bills. Yeah, yeah. But for my more rural constituents who are off the mains gas grid, yeah. uh, they have seen heating oil prices rise over double in the past year. Yeah. The £100 support is welcome, but can the Chancellor and the Business Secretary review this support in yeah. light of these severe yeah. price rises? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I am in yeah. frequent uh, contact with my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary. We actually sequestered, we dedicated a pot specifically to help uh, people who are off. Uh, the gas grid, but we're very happy, uh, I uh, and my uh, right honourable friend, uh, to help uh, her, uh, my honourable friend and her constituents uh, in this challenging time. Rachel Muscle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the light that the Bank of England is having to go even further to refinance the UK government bond market, what discussions has the Chancellor had with the pensions regulator about the viability of defined benefit schemes and the devaluation of defined contribution schemes or annuities? Were workers going to have to pay for this? Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend, the Financial Secretary of the Treasury, and I uh, are engaged with all the regulators, particularly the PRA. And we will uh, be absolutely uh, committed to getting to the bottom of what's happened in the long, particularly the long-dated uh, gilt market, where uh, it's been over-levered over the last few weeks. Mark Harper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Chancellor said that he's going to set out a fully costed plan to get debt falling as a proportion of GDP, which he's confirmed that the dispatch box will be done in just under three weeks. Time. The Institute for Fiscal Studies in their report this morning has suggested that in order to do so, there will need to be fiscal tightening of around £62 billion pounds, uh, by the next, in the next four years. Um, does the Chancellor agree with their analysis? And if he doesn't, as I suspect is the case, can you just set out for the House why not? As I've said Chancellor. repeatedly, I'm not going to prejudge what's in the medium-term fiscal plan. Which, is, which, he will, which will be fully scrutinised, not only by the OBR, but I'm sure by the right honourable gentleman, my, my friend, the right honourable uh, member um, uh, himself. So I don't think uh, it's right for me to, to prejudge or anticipate uh, the measures there uh, today. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, currently, the IMF, despite the Chancellor's confident words, the IMF is predicting that inflation will last longer in this country than in other similar economies. And in my constituency of Edinburgh West, where we have half the national average rate of unemployment and claimants, people are so concerned that more than half of them are talking about cutting their essential budgets, and 20 per cent, according to recent reports, are concerned that they might have to turn to food banks for the first time. So when will the Chancellor 
reassess the potential impact of this growth plan and accept that maybe he's got it wrong? The IMF very specifically said this morning that the 2023 forecast for growth in this country has gone up as a direct consequence of the mini budget. In, in respect of uh, helping uh, constituents up and down the land, we have uh, already committed to £37 billion of energy support this year. We have committed to a further £60 billion in respect of households and uh, uh, businesses over the next six months, and we are committed to making sure that every uh, one of our constituents uh, gets through this uh, winter as best they can. Sir Britliff. Mr Speaker, I have had numerous residents such as those at Harwood Bar Caravan Park get in touch about the £400 energy support scheme. The previous Chancellor confirmed that there was an equivalent scheme for those in caravan parks and park homes. Can the Chancellor please provide an update for my residents in Hamburg and Haslund? As I said in relation to heating oil, there is a, a pot of money that is going to be reserved for people to help people who are off uh, the grid. And that's something that uh, we've already made announcements about, but I'd be very happy to speak with her and also with my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary. Christian Matheson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Chester City walls cost about £600,000 a year to uh, upkeep, but that money has to come out of the local authorities' uh, highways budget. Can the Government set aside a small amount of money to help local authorities with the stewardship of internationally important heritage assets? Minister. The government continues to support the heritage and cultural sector. There are several sources of funding from government arm's length bodies, such as the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Historic England's Repair Grants. So I would encourage uh, the, right, the Honourable Gentleman to look into those. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the 1970s, residents in Eastleigh have long been expecting and have been promised at times funding for the Chicken Hall Lane bypass, including being allocated funding in the 2015 Red Book. Will the, Chief, will the Minister agree to meet with me and Hampshire County Council to discuss getting this sorted for people who have waited for simply far too long? Minister. Well, my honourable friend is a tireless advocate for this and other projects in his constituency, and of course, I and perhaps colleagues from the Department of Transport would be delighted to meet with him and his county council colleagues to discuss this important project. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chancellor was warned that unfunded tax cuts would force the Bank of England to increase rates, and that's exactly what's happened. And the Bank of England today has said that the mini budget, in effect, has caused a material risk to Britain's financial stability. Can the Chancellor explain? Can the Chancellor explain? Explain how people are supposed to pay their mortgages that have gone up by £500 on average and £900 in London. What is he going to do about it? Because it is not acceptable that his incompetence is risking people's livelihoods. So, two uh, points to that. Firstly, the Bank of England did not say that the mini budget uh, increased uh, risk. That they certainly did not say that. The second issue is that, of course, uh, as uh, global rates are rising, uh, rates are rising throughout the world, uh, there is exposure, and that's precisely why we thought that uh, it, it right, and it was absolutely right, to have the energy intervention, which was for two years. I mean, the Labour plan was only six months. Uh, let's not forget that. Uh, and secondly, to reduce the burden on people uh, by uh, reducing taxes. The Thank you, sir. Talk to people working in the housing industry in Winchester. They're not convinced that the stamp duty reduction will help first-time buyers while inflation and particularly mortgage rates are creeping up. The lenders are coming back with some good rates, and the Chancellor will know that. But when he delivers his statement on the 31st of October, will he ensure that it has confidence at its heart? And knowing him, it will be this, a relentlessly positive statement so that we can push confidence right the way through the market. It will be relentlessly uh, upbeat. Um, it, they are challenging times, but we've got to live within our means, and there will be an absolute uh, iron commitment to fiscal responsibility. Steve McKay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister admit that if the Government does not increase the guarantee credit component of pension credit in line with inflation this year, it is effectively cutting the incomes of our poorest pensioners when they need help most? <laughs> we are absolutely Chancellor. committed to fairness um, and helping the most vulnerable in our society. We are always uh, committed to that, and I will not prejudge 
or anticipate measures in the medium-term fiscal plan uh, this afternoon. Dr Ben Spencer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend confirm that the cuts to national insurance will not only help working households, but also businesses and the public sector, such as schools? He's, uh, my honourable friend and constituency neighbour, dare I say, is absolutely right. Uh, the uh, reversal of the planned increase in national insurance will help businesses, uh, will help individuals and also will help the institutions that he refers to. Emma Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Chancellor state how much the investment zones are worth and how they will be funded? There will be uh, more detail about uh, investment, uh, investment zones. My right honourable friend, the DLUC Secretary of State, will be updating the House on the uh, specifics on uh, the investment zones. Final question, Kevin Holman, right? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK has quite rightly frozen around £30 billion of Russian foreign currency reserves. A number of countries are moving from freezing those assets to seizing them to pay reparations to Ukraine. Would my right honourable friend look at similar measures from the UK? This has been uh, discussed in the past. I think my, the, the, um, the, the, honourable, the right honourable member for Surrey Heath. Uh, did uh, talk about this earlier in the year, uh, and these schemes are always being looked at in light of what is an increasingly bleak situation uh, in, in Russia Ukraine. Volatile. Right, let us start with the urgent questions. We'll just let the bench clear. No problem, look at yourself. Urgent question to buy Elwood. Mr Speaker, regarding Ukraine, could I ask the Secretary of State to make a statement on our policy to deter and, if required, respond to the use of nuclear weapons by President Putin? Minister, and welcome. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Russia's continuing assault on Ukraine is an unprovoked, premeditated attack against a sovereign democratic state and which continues to threaten global stability. This week, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Defence, is meeting with defence ministers in Brussels to discuss further support for Ukraine. And later today, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, will be speaking to members of the G7. 